for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Deller. I'm Benson, Johnny. How fast can you get to Kansas City, Missouri? Why? Maybe you can stop a homicide. Well, that sounds worthwhile. What's the dope? We underwrite complete insurance coverage for the Patterson Transport Corporation. They handle a parcel delivery service for most of the department stores in town. Well, that should be profitable, but hardly deadly. There have been six robberies and beatings involving their drivers in the past week, Johnny. Apparently, one guy is responsible, and he's gotten increasingly brutal with each holdup. How far has he gone? The last holdup was yesterday afternoon. He went berserk. Driver's in the hospital with five broken ribs and a fractured skull. If this guy isn't caught, it's only a question of time before he kills somebody. I'll take the first plane out. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? In 1884, with a limited education and practically no experience in national affairs, he was elected president at the age of 48. During his administration, an income tax was passed, but declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. And Coxey's army made its first march on the Capitol as a protest against unemployment. It was also during his administration that the presidential succession bill was passed, which indicated the line of succession to the presidency from the president down through the cabinet. If you don't have his name by now, here are two more clues. He was the first president to be married in the White House and the only president to serve two non-successive terms. Who was he? Grover Cleveland, 22nd and 24th president of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office Eastern Indemnity and Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Patterson transport matter. Expense account item one, seventy-three dollars and twenty cents. Airfare and incidentals between Hartford, Connecticut, and Kansas City, Missouri. I was met at the airport by Walt Hendricks, vice president and general manager of Patterson Transport. It's a rough one dollar. Six holdups in a week. Over $3,700 in COD money stolen. Three drivers beaten so badly they can't work. One of them in the hospital in critical condition. Real rough one. I understand one man has been pulling the job, Mr. Hendricks. Seems to stack up that way. So far, we haven't been able to do a blast thing to stop him. How's he operating? Well, it's like this. He buys something at a department store. Has the package sent out COD to a vacant apartment or house. When the driver gets out there, he lowers the boom. Mm Mm-hmm. What about the police? Well, since yesterday morning, they've had a plain clothesman riding the delivery trucks with the drivers. Well, that should have brought results. Yeah, we thought it would, too, till last night. The driver that's laid up in the hospital? Yeah. He got it in his own garage, coming home from a movie with his wife. Hendricks dropped me off at the Muleback Hotel. He said the Patterson Transport Company would supply a car for my personal use. And it was there, ready and waiting, after I finished checking in. I drove over to police headquarters at 1125 Locust Street, where Lieutenant Herman of the robbery division filled me in. Well, there's a few things about this that make sense, Dollar. Not many, but a few. Like what, Lieutenant? The way he operates, for one, has a definite pattern. Every holdup's either at the far end of the driver's route or the last stop or two before he checks in for the day. Sounds like he's pretty familiar with the delivery operation. Yeah, that's what we figure. Maybe from the Patterson Transport end, maybe from the department stores. And then another thing. He's almost sure to be a psycho. The way he's manhandled those drivers? There wasn't any reason for beating him. Drivers all have orders not to resist. He gets increasingly brutal with every holdup. No sense to it. Unless he's a psycho. Mm-hmm. Any description on him? Yeah. Partial. Always wears a blue bandana handkerchief over his face. But uh, here's what we've got on him for what it's worth. Let's see, about six feet. 
190 to 200 pounds, gray slouch hat, baggy gray suit. Has a noticeable limp in the right leg. Hmm. Well, that's pretty general, but that limp might help tie him down. I've got the personnel managers of Patterson and the department stores going over their records on the basis of that description. So far, they haven't come up with anything. But here's another angle. Take a look at this man. Yeah, sure. Now, the first robbery took place out here, 43 under block in Seneca. The next, here, at Observation Park. And one here on Cypress. The next at 32nd Terrace. Then 54th and Jackson. Well, that makes a rough circle around the city. What's he been doing? Moving from route to route in a definite pattern? That's it. Hitting one driver after another in turn. Well, then you should know who's liable to be next on the list. We do. Driver by the name of Milton Spears. He's got the Southwest Territory down here. If the man we're after follows his pattern, we'll get him. But if he breaks it like he did last night... Yeah... Now, that's about all I can tell you now, Dollar. We are hoping this guy will try again with our men riding the trucks. It's our best bet for getting him. And even if he doesn't, maybe we can... Oh, hi, Grayson. Hey, Thomas. We well, just got a report over in traffic division. One of the Patterson Company's trucks was in an accident on Anderson Avenue. What kind of accident? Well, apparently the truck got out of control, smashed into a parked car along the curb. The driver was killed. What about our man? He didn't have anybody assigned to it. The truck had been in for repair, and the driver was just road testing it. Doesn't sound like it ties in with a hold-up. I thought you'd better know. Well, thanks, Grayson. Let me see the complete report when you get it in. Yeah, sure, Lieutenant. Say, Sergeant. Yeah? Did you get the name of the driver who was killed? Yeah, we got it. The name was Spears. Milton Spears. When we got to the scene of the accident, an ambulance and squad car were already there. Sure. One of the squad car men filled us in on what they'd learned. He was heading east on Anderson here, Lieutenant. Then for some reason, he suddenly clamped the wheel to the right and plowed into that Buick there at the curb. He must have been going at a pretty good clip. Burned a lot of rubber off on the street when he swung in here. Yeah. What did the ambulance men have to say? He was dead when they got here. Didn't look as though the crash killed him. No impact wasn't heavy enough for that. I think he might have had a heart attack. Uh Uh-huh. Any witnesses? No eyewitnesses, Lieutenant. But there's a lady over there who wants to talk to you. Okay, ask her to come over. And have them take the body down to the morgue for an immediate autopsy. I want the results on it as soon as possible. Okay, Lieutenant. Oh, how does it hit you, Dollar? Well, a couple of things don't quite add up. Take him down to the like morgue. Like what? Well, why he was road testing a truck on a quiet residential street. Why he was going fast enough to make heavy skid marks like that. And why it had to happen to a driver by the name of Yeah. Well, maybe the autopsy will give us something to go on. Yeah, maybe. Here's the lady I was telling you about, Lieutenant. Mrs. Robertson. How do you do, Mrs. Robertson? I understand you have something to tell us. I should say I do have something to tell you, Lieutenant. It's about time you police officers did something to protect the interests of our citizens. We've got rights, you know. And it's your duty to see that that they're protected. I'm not sure I understand. No, I didn't think you would. Things have come to a pretty pass when a taxpayer can't leave a car parked out on the street without some drunken truck driver smashing it to pieces. It's your duty to see that such reckless, incompetent drivers are kept off our streets and highways. You're the owner of the Buick that was hit, Mrs. Robertson? Well, isn't that just what I've been telling you, young man? And believe me, somebody is going to pay for the damage done to my car and for the shock and damage caused to my nerves. Uh, Did you see the accident take place, Mrs. Robertson? No, I, I didn't see it. Not that I had to. I I was upstairs in my apartment over there, playing whist with some friends. Then what makes you think the driver was drunk or irresponsible? Oh, of course he was. What other explanation could there be? Smashing into a person's car like that in broad daylight on a quiet street. There's not the slightest doubt in my mind. Both of them were drunk. And there was somebody else in the truck besides the driver? Of course there was. How do you know, Mrs. Robertson? Oh, because I saw him, that's why. I I looked out of my window and saw him. A big, husky man he was. He got out of the truck right after the crash and went limping off down the street. Additional questioning of the excitable Mrs. Robertson brought no further information. We got the same results from the other residents of Anderson Avenue. The men from the lab arrived and started working on the truck and Buick for possible physical evidence, and we went back to police headquarters. 
No need for you to stick around, Dollar. Unless you want to. You won't be getting the autopsy report on Spears for another hour or two. Well, I thought I might look over the driver's statements on the robbery, Lieutenant. Maybe something will hit me. Oh, sure. I'll have Grayson dig them out for you. Yes, sir. Grayson, will you get out the driver's statements in the Patterson transport files? Mr. Dollar would like to look them over. Well, I've got them right here, Lieutenant. Adding another report to the list. Well, what's that? Got a call from General Hospital. The driver who was beaten up last night just died. I went over the driver's statements and the official investigation reports. Lieutenant Herman and his men had covered every angle I could think of, and a couple I hadn't. When I got through, the autopsy on Milton Spears hadn't been completed yet, so I drove out to the Patterson Transport Company in the Northeast Industrial District. I found Walt Hendricks in the offices of the company, which were located to one side of their busy garage. Oh, it's a terrible thing about Milt Spears, Dollar, a terrible thing. The man had been with us for 15 years, perfect safety record, and gets himself killed in an accident that way. If it was an accident. Well, you think it's connected with the holdups? We'll know more about it when we get the autopsy report. Well, I suppose it could tie in. According to the pattern, Spears was the next driver due to get hit. Sure, and if it had happened while Spears was out on the route, I'd say okay, but he wasn't. Just what was he doing, Mr. Hendricks? Well, his truck broke down, the clutch linkage. We sent a substitute out. When the garage got through, Milt took the truck out to road test it. Anybody go with him? No, no. Milt was a good mechanic. No reason to send anybody along. And we don't allow our men to pick up any riders or hitchhikers. No, there couldn't have been anybody in the truck, could there? Well, maybe he picked up somebody he knew. Well, uh, possibility, I suppose. I, I, I don't know, Dollar. This thing's got me so dizzy, I can't think straight at all. I guess there's one consolation, though. Yeah, what's that? If you count Spears, every driver in the organization's been hit by now. Unless he starts over again, this guy has any place to go. I'll give you eight to five. He'll think of something. It was getting late in the afternoon, so I figured I'd pay one more visit to headquarters before going back to the hotel and knocking off for the day. As I walked into Lieutenant Herman's office, he was just finishing a phone call. Okay, Doc. Thanks for the past report. I'll buy you a dinner someday if you're lucky enough to catch up with me. Oh, hi, Dollar. I was Doc Winters, autopsy surgeon. There was a 22 caliber bullet in Milton Spears' brain. Wow. Nothing very accidental about that, is there? Not likely. Fired at close range behind the right ear. Point of penetration was covered by hair. Bullet lodged in the bone. That's why the ambulance attendants didn't catch him. No wonder he crashed the truck. Yeah. We'll have ballistics examine the bullet. Don't know that they'll come up with anything, though. Well, it's been a long day. What do you say we go out and have a bite to eat? I'll buy that, Lieutenant. There's a good steakhouse right down. Lieutenant Herman. I remember... We'll be right there. Now, let's roll, Dollar. What's up? Remember that Mrs. Robertson? The woman who owned the smashed-up Buick? Yeah. We just saw the man we were after. He's out in front of her place right now. Mind if I cut in to say something, fellas? It won't take too long, since a word to the wise is sufficient. And in the English language, there is one word which is important to just about everyone in the world. That word is security. Security has several different meanings, however. Usually, we think of it in connection with the protecting of our military installations and defense industries. But it means more than that. There is a security which applies to every man, woman, and child in America. The security which comes from being in good health, having a good education, and being well taken care of in case things get a little too tough to handle by oneself. This kind of security is the problem of the president's newest cabinet member, the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. 
This department ties together the work of several governmental agencies. First, there is the United States Public Health Service, which strives to make certain that the general health of the people in our country is in the best of conditions. Then, there is the Food and Drug Administration, which guarantees that the food we eat is pure and safe to eat. The Social Security Board, which takes care of old people, children, and the blind who need assistance, also comes under the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, as does the United States Office of Education. This office does research on the educational possibilities, changes, and opportunities, and passes on its information to the various state boards of education. As you can see, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare is one of the most important agencies in our government, assuring us, as it does, of a normal and healthy way of life. And now with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Lieutenant Herman and I got out to the Anderson Avenue address. Mrs. Robertson was waiting for us in the vestibule of the apartment building. It's the man, I tell you. The very same man who got out of the truck that smashed my car. And I want you to arrest him at once, do you hear? If he's a man, we'll arrest him, Mrs. Robertson. Of course he's a man. I ought to know. I saw him get out of the truck and limp down the street. And I saw him again just before I called you. What was he doing, Mrs. Robertson? Looking over my car, that's what. The nerve of him. (laughs) A criminal returning to the scene of his crime. There's no doubt about the identification. I told you there wasn't, didn't I? A big, heavy set man, dressed in a a gray suit, walking with a limp. He's the man, all right. Where is he now? Oh, where would a man like that be? I told you he was drunk when he smashed into my car. He went into that bar at the corner. Answer the description. You want to take him over there? As good a place as any. Police officers, keep your hands on the bar. Hey, what's going on here? Hands on the bar. Shake him down, Dollar. Yeah, sure. What do you think you're doing, Mac? I ain't got no rod on me. How about it? He's clean, Lieutenant. Sure, I'm clean. I told you I was, didn't I? Now, what do you guys want with me? What's your name, mister? What's it to you? Your name. Wesley, Gerald Wesley. Where do you live? I ain't decided yet. Just got into town. What are you doing in this neighborhood? Look, you guys ain't got nothing on me. A guy's got a right to come in and have a drink without coppers hopping all over him. Why the interest in the car, Wesley? What car? The smashed up Buick down the street. Who's interested in a smashed Buick? You were. You were looking at it. Why? So I looked at it. Any law against that? Man was killed when that car was hit, Wesley. So what's that got to do with me? We've got a witness who says you were involved in the accident. Your witness is nuts. All I was doing was walking down the street. I seen the car, took a gander at it. Well, you talk it over downtown, Wesley. There ain't nothing to talk. I didn't have nothing to do with that car or somebody getting bumped off. You heard the lieutenant. We'll talk about it downtown. <laughs> Clean, Wesley. Make it easier on yourself. There's nothing to come clean about. I told you, coppers, that you ain't got nothing on me. We've got a witness who says different. I told you he's lying. I've never been in that neighborhood before. What did you do with the gun? What gun? The one you used to knock off Milton Spears. I never had a gun. And I never heard of the Spears. Now, why didn't you guys lay off and let me out of here? Pretty good racket you had, Wesley. How'd you happen to think of it? What racket? The parcel delivery gimmick. You nuts or something. I didn't have nothing to do with them Patterson trucks. We didn't mention the name of the outfit, Wesley. So you didn't mention it. Then how'd you know what we were talking about? I can read the papers, can't I? They've been full of them parcel delivery stick-ups. You know more about it than that. Come on, let's have it, Wesley. I tell you, nuts. I just got into town yesterday. From where? California. Where in California? Folsom. 
We can check on that, Wesley. So check. You'll find out it's like I said. You ain't got a thing on me, coppers. Not a lousy thing. Lieutenant Herman sent in a teletype request for verification from Folsom, along with telephoto copies of Wesley's prints for comparison. We got the answer back in an hour. Well, there it is, Bella. Wesley wasn't sprung from Folsom until yesterday morning. Served his full time. We made one more check. We had Mrs. Robertson try to pick out the man she'd seen from a lineup including Wesley and six police officers. She made a positive identification of Sergeant Grayson. Expense account item two, $17.85, dinner and drinks for Lieutenant Herman and myself. Afterwards, the lieutenant called it quits for the night, and I headed for the Patterson garage. I wanted to talk with Walt Hendricks again. Lucky to catch me in, Dollar. Don't usually work this late, but it's different tonight. Well, what's different about it, Mr. Hendricks? I've got some drivers to get. A couple of substitutes for those who are laid up. Two permanent ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, I won't take up too much of your time. I just want to get a few things straight. Sure. Uh, it's pretty obvious that whoever we're after knows the operation of this business. Uh, that means he knew he wasn't going to get much of a take on those morning stick-ups. The drivers hadn't time to collect many CODs. No, but he got over 3700 on the afternoon job. Nothing wrong with that. I don't say there is. But it's possible that money is only the frosting on the cake. Thinking that somebody might have a grudge against the outfit? Well, there's enough evidence to support it. Mm. The systematic way he's gone after the drivers, the beatings he's dished out for no apparent reason. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. Come up with any ideas? No, not a one. Company's always had a good labor record. Never any fuss with competitors. I even checked with Mrs. Thompson about it. Who's Mrs. Thompson? Oh, she worked here for almost 20 years as my assistant and secretary. Had an auto accident about six months ago. Left her crippled. Oh, that's tough. Yeah. But she knows the business as well as I do, so I thought maybe she'd come up with something. Have any luck? Nothing. I even talked to her husband about it. Did he work for the outfit, too? No, no, but he got to know it pretty well through her. And he figured it the same way we do, that he couldn't come up with anything either. He did try to warn Milt Spears, though. How was that? Well, he had the guy's pattern figured out, too, a new Milt might be next. So we warned him to be careful. Mrs. Thompson's husband was here at the garage before Milt Spears left? Yeah, yeah that's right. He drove up just a few minutes before Milt took off to road test the truck. <laughs> I went back to the hotel and put in a call to Tom Benson in Hartford. In the company's interest, he was willing to bust up his bridge game and go down to the office. He called me back in about 45 minutes with the information I wanted. The accident took place last Christmas Eve, Johnny. The Thompsons were leaving a party at the Patterson offices. Apparently, the husband had a little too much to drink. Drove out of the garage too fast, skidded as he hit the street, and wound up on the wrong side. One of the delivery trucks was just coming in. I met head on. Uh-huh. What's the medical report say? Well, the driver of the truck was killed outright. Mrs. Thompson suffered two broken vertebrae, left her permanently crippled. We paid all medical expenses. She got a life income of $100 a month. What about the husband? He was in the hospital up until a couple of weeks ago. Had a depressed skull fracture, bad compound fracture of the right tibia. Outside of that, he should be as good as new. Help you any, Johnny? I wouldn't be surprised. The Thompson home was a modest frame bungalow on Prospect Avenue, less than a half mile from the Patterson garage. I was met at the door by a practical nurse who checked with Mrs. Thompson and then led me into the bedroom to see her. It was awfully kind of you to call on me this way, Mr. Darley. And I want you to know that Charlie and I are very appreciative of everything your company has done for us. You're only getting what you're entitled to, Mrs. Thompson? Well, perhaps. But when you've been used to making your own way of life, earning your own living, then suddenly find yourself in a position like I'm in, well, it's awfully nice to know that there are people like you around. Well, thanks, Mrs. Thompson. Is your husband at home? I'm dreadfully sorry, but he left just a few minutes ago, and you did want to talk to him about those robberies, didn't you? What makes you think that? Oh, Mr. Hendricks told me you were in town. 
And Charlie's been so interested in those holdups. Well, he just feels terrible about those poor drivers, you know. No, I didn't. Oh, yes. Just terrible. He's been so worried about them ever since the trouble began. Well, he even wanted to ride along with some of them on their route to help protect them. Is that so? Yes, he's felt that way, you know, protective about them ever since that accident happened to us. Some men might have felt the driver was to blame that night. Might have felt resentful toward them because of what happened to me. But not Charlie. He's a wonderfully forgiving man, Mr. Dollar. Where is your husband now? Yes. He even had a presentiment about what was going to happen to them after the holdup started. He told me he was afraid that robber would go from one driver to the next, beating them, perhaps even killing them. He even made a list of the ones he was afraid would be hurt. Where is he now, Mrs. Thompson? That's why he went out tonight, Mr. Dollar. He's determined he won't let anything like that happen again. That's why he went out to protect him. To protect who? Well, the next one on his list, of course. My former employer, Mr. Hendricks. The phone was in the living room. I put in two fast calls. The first to police headquarters. I'll have a car right out, Donna. The second was to the Patterson garage to warn Hendricks. The garage was only a few short blocks away, and I made it before the squad car did. There was a light in Hendricks' office, but it was empty. I tried the darkened garage next. Thompson? Is that you, Thompson? Thompson? What's going on out there? What's the shooting about? It's Dollar, Hendricks. Dollar? Yeah. Throw some lights on, will you? Yeah, sure. What's going on here, Dollar? What are you... Oh, Charlie Thompson. Yeah. Where were you? In the back room. But Charlie... But what happened? Well, somebody had to stop him from protecting you. Expense account item three, $22.10. Hotel bill and miscellaneous. Expense account item four, $71.30. Airfare back to Hartford. Expense account total, $184.45. Remarks. When ballistics verified that Thompson's 22 Colt had killed Milton Spears, my official job was over. My unofficial one, informing Mrs. Thompson, wasn't nearly as easy. I guess I got a little confused. It's the only way I can account for the fact that she believes her husband died a hero, getting the bandit single-handed. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.